she's a mountain then you're an ocean hi everybody this is lori and i am the founder of a company called inclusivity and also the author of a new book you can save the world in fact you're the only one who can and this is our podcast, Inclusive Talks Sustainability. And on our podcast, we talk with creative people and also people in the sustainable uh, living sphere about basically about being creative and living a sustainable life. So today we're really fortunate to have with us Daphne Orlando, who is a, well, a part of the fashion world and has her own brand and her own products that she sells and so and is trying to do so in an environmentally friendly way so we really want to thank you for being here Daphne yeah thanks for having me so I want to start out just by you sort of introducing what you're doing now so what you, what your brand is and, mm -hmm. and what what your purpose is yeah so, uh, so my brand is Eco Petites, and uh, it's a brand of clothing that is designed and made specifically for shorter women, 4'11 to 5'4, uh, um, with, with ethics and sustainability in mind. So uh, the fabrics are, um, there's a, a, are sustainable, so they're either organic cotton, um, there's recycled fibers, such as there's recycled uh, polyester, uh, hemp. Um, so I'm, I'm wearing what this is a combination of hemp and organic cotton. And the, the dress underneath is a combination of hemp and organic cotton as well. Um, there's also soy and bamboo. Um, so, so it's a little bit about the fabrics. And then, uh, and then they are made... In, in the USA, and not only in the USA, but here locally in the Twin Cities area, okay. um, which is very important to me uh, to, um, for the purpose of um, making sure that they're ethically made and that I can personally visit and know who is making the clothes and that the conditions are, are appropriate and, and all of that. So. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. So how did you get to, to doing this? I don't think this is what you've done your, your whole career. So how did you get here? No. Yeah. So my career started, I started out as a medical illustrator. That's what I did for almost 20 years. And um, so, so what got me into this is, um, is adopting my son, believe it or not. So I, uh, so I have, I have two kids, but my first son, um, was adopted from Guatemala. And, um, and at that time the, of his adoption, I was, I was already introduced into the world of, of, um, of organics by having become a member of the, the local co-op and getting the newsletter and learning a lot about the importance of organic agriculture and why it makes a difference, who it impacts, all of that. And, uh, and it, it, it wasn't much of a stretch to then start wondering about the fibers or the agriculture behind the fibers involved in, in clothing. And, uh, and I'm also an avid knitter. So, so it's kind of, that was kind of what, where I was starting to think about it. And, um, and because, because of, my son being being Mayan and being from Guatemala, I ended up at this lecture given by Rigoberta Menchutum at uh, one of the local universities. Uh, I think it was through the University of Minnesota, and it was it was heart wrenching and moving. Uh, and it, so she talks in general. She talks about the plight of native peoples in Central and South America and how that stories is, is and was, is being repeated over and over and over. That's basically the same story. And, um, and her goal is to raise awareness of that. And in her, in her story, part of it, she tells about watching her, her little brother die in a cotton field, basically of starving, of, basically of um, issues of poverty 
all, you know, it sounded very preventable. And I left feeling like I could not be part of that system and at the same time benefit from having gained this wonderful child into my life. And I felt like I felt compelled to do something. So at, so my, so, you know, at the time I wasn't thinking I'd start a business at the time. What I did is I spent a year boycotting all, all newly produced conventional cotton. So for me and my family and what I discovered in that year is there were some things that were easier, some that were harder. Uh, it was, it was not hard to find clothes for my kids. For example, they, I could find organic cotton children's clothing. Um, and it also was fairly easy to find, um, used clothing at, 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 um, used clothing stores. But for me, and, and even even for their dad, it wasn't. It, I was able to find men's clothing um, that was um, that was organic cotton or um, more or more sustainably made. But for me, it was hard. I'm five feet tall, and um, and I had a hard time finding clothes that that would fit, you know. And um, I ended up buying. A lot. I sew. So I ended up buying organic fabric and making almost all my clothing. Um, and it dawned on me, and I'm probably not the only one with that problem, that I want to be part of the, the, this change in the fashion world. Um, but most of what I was finding that was out there um, was for the so-called straight sizes, which means uh, it's designed for women who are who are five seven, and um, and within a certain weight range. And I'm not that, so <laughs> I figured, you know, I'd, I'd at least cover part of that excluded uh, uh, group of people, being the shorter half. Um, but interestingly enough, I also discovered. Uh, in doing my research, that fifty percent of American women are five four and under. Fifty percent, wow. yeah. So it's just so. The, so it's so a huge. Find, if there's a huge it, need. It's it's a huge need, and um, and I just and it also was kind of eye opening about the fashion industry in general mm -hmm. that um, that the the idea of any of, of any new direction for the fashion the 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 less risky path is this is the straight sizes which are really only targeting maybe 20 percent of women yeah you know and you know because you have to be the right height and the right weight and and the right shape too mm -hmm. you know so yeah so <laughs> i'm I, there is so much to unpack in what you just said so first i want to say um i started inclusivity with the same kind of passion so for you it was your child and recognizing sort of recognizing through him because you were exploring and because you were trying to find out more that there was this big issue going on that was this inequity and so mm -hmm. I love that because it brings about the sustainability idea that it's not just using sustainable fabrics, it's also who produces it and how is it made and how are workers treated. Children should not be dying in cotton fields, right? So yeah. I think that all of that is so crucial and wonderful that you found out all of that on your path. Um, I, I love that you did the research because that's something that we talk about at inclusivity all the time too that we need to know because sometimes we think we know and then we as we do more research we find out we we, we were wrong or mm -hmm. we didn't have all of the information we needed and it sounds like mm -hmm. you've really taken that path of trying to continue to learn and create a product yeah. that that really fits the facts that fits mm -hmm. what's really needed and mm -hmm. what's really there yeah so and are is, you oh, are you still doing medical um, drawing or are you 
out of that? No. So I, I, um, so I'm, I'm doing this eco, eco petites business full time now. So, um, yeah. Great name yeah. too. Oh, thank you. So as you sort of entered this new field, which again, must have been, I, I, from personal experience, understand must have been pretty overwhelming at times. Mm -hmm. What were the, the things that you sort of brought with you from mm. earlier that really mm -hmm. helped? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the things that I think comes up over and over that, um, that helps me Daphne, you're frozen. Are you back? I can't hear you. Still frozen? Oh, no, now no, you're no, good. Oh, no. Um, not, and we'll just cut that okay, part out so okay. we can just continue. You were saying one of the things, so you mm -hmm. can start there. Yeah. So one of the things that, that certainly has helped is uh, as in my having experience in illustration and graphics has meant that I can do that part myself and that I'm very comfortable uh, doing that part. Um, so, you know, it's nice when you go into a new field that there's at least yeah, you, know, you are, as an entrepreneur, as you know, you wear all these hats. It's nice yeah. to have at least one hat that you're like, okay, this hat is really comfortable. <laughs> this is familiar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Daphne, the, the um, illustrations for medical, um, that sounds artistic to me. So it sounds like you really have an art background. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about how that started and when yeah. did you first start exploring that? Yeah. Um, so, so I feel like I started exploring that idea, um, in college, I was a double major in art and biology. And I remember a professor pulling me aside and telling me about the, this career, um, early, fairly early in my college, you know, experience. I was probably a, a sophomore, I am guessing. So, so that's, that is kind of how I remember it, but I've had people tell me, no, you always, <laughs> always were a medical illustrator. So, so some of the things that people had, some of my earlier memories and other, and experiences of that is I do remember when I was somewhere around 12 or 13, seeing a National Geographic article about um about this underwater coral reef display that was being created and and in the article they interviewed and talked about the people making it and they were medical illustrators they were sculptors in the medical illustration field or, or biologic illustration and i remember being like like wow, this is so cool. This is like the coolest profession I've ever heard of. So, so I can see why people <laughs> have told me later, no, you were saying you wanted to be a medical <laughs> illustrator since you were a, kid, a little kid. Um, so that's, that's one of my experiences. And even going back further, mm -hmm. I remember, um, I, so I, every summer I used to go to an arts camp and I would take, um, I specialize, so you could do, you could have like a major and a minor. And, sure. um, and um, I, I, I ended up, I, I actually ended up at the arts camp because of my choir teacher from elementary school told me about it. But I ended up being, uh, being more, having more of a pull to the art side of it. And, um, and I remember, in the painting class, I was ended up being a painting major. Um, we, my class, we was we were working on 
the sets for um, for the the theater group that does a play every year. And I was assigned all the flesh tones. And I and I remember I was surprised, but the the teacher was saying, because you like doing figure painting, you are good at mm -hmm. flesh tones. And 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 it and at, I remember at the time it like like how did like I didn't know that about myself. Mm -hmm. How does this person know something about me? I don't even know about myself, but as I got into painting and I was like, dang it, he was right. He was totally <laughs> right. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of the, the training in order to even get into school for medical illustrations, you have to, you have to have a lot of figure drawing and figure painting. Um, so, um, so, so I think that that showed an early propensity for, um, being involved in the arts in a way that has a, um, that's also about depicting humans, mm -hmm. de depicting people. And, um, and actually that's another tie now, you know, I, I, um, as much as I, 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 to be honest, I prefer hiring a photographer, but to save money, I sometimes do it right. myself. And I, and so I practice photography, um, even, when I'm not doing a photo shoot and I find I, I love doing, doing, you know, portraits and people in the, and like that's depicting people has far more interest for me than, um, as opposed to, for example, landscapes. Sure. So, um, so I think I've always had an interest in the human form and human anatomy. And that's probably also, way that has carried over into in terms of getting a great fit in the clothing i was going to say that that understanding of human anatomy i would think would lend itself well to you as you look at sizes and try to figure mm -hmm. out you know what's going to fit a different mm -hmm. person people of different sizes because yeah. that's really what you're looking for is mm -hmm. people who don't again fit that five seven mm -hmm. hundred five seven hundred and twenty pound model right that we, right. that we use as the clothing. Um, yeah. The clothing base. The standard. For, for yeah. 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 So it sounds like you've been an artist your whole life. And mm -hmm. it sounds, it's fascinating to, to hear how you've kind of always been a human artist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that your figures have always been humans for your whole life. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, when did you retire from the medical illustration? <laughs> I've never heard someone say it that way. Retire. Um, <laughs> um, when did I retire? Uh, there was an overlap period for sure of still doing medical illustration while I started this business. Uh, you know, it kind of tapered off. Um, but I would say by the time by the time I launched Eco Petites, like in its current form, um, you know, I had a, a few, you know, beta versions. <laughs> so in, in its current form, that would have been June of 2016. So I would say that was approximately when I stopped doing medical illustration. And I wouldn't even say retired because it's not like someone had a project for me right now. I, I might take it, okay. you know, depending okay. on. How much so you're not pursuing to... projects, but you're not, you're not necessarily retired from the field. Right. Okay. Yeah. What's your favorite thing about running this company, Eco Petites? Mm. Oh, um, well, I, I like, I like the creativity of it. Um, okay. You said the favorite thing. Um, you can have 10 if you want. <laughs> it can be your 10 favorite things. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I think actually what I would say is that it, there's a sense of purpose. I think I've always wanted to have a sense of purpose that I'm, I'm part of a change or a, or a pivot in the fashion industry to be more conscientious about the impact that, that we're having on other people. Absolutely. That's it. 
that's a pretty great thing. And what else do you do? What else do you enjoy besides the, the fashion and the illustration? Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned knitting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm also an avid reader. Um, and, and well, this, I, I also found recently that I like to write, um, which I, I never thought of myself as a writer. And I, and even when starting my blog, it was more because I just, you know, why did I start it? I started it because I felt like there's an educational aspect to what I do that needs to be out there. Um, and, and also to be honest, there's part of it is because you're told it's like one of the things you're supposed to do and, and to get to make sure you're putting something out there, you're producing. And, um, and I find I, I actually really like writing, mm -hmm. um, which has been kind of a recent surprise for me. Um, I also like cooking. Mm -hmm. So um when when you're writing what do you like to write like what is your tell us a little bit about what your blog reflects mm. i um well there's i i always in the back of my mind have this intention of the educational aspect which i which i do think is is important and i think people want to know uh at the same time, I, I like to write a little bit about um, about like what what are my what am I currently struggling with at the moment, and what what are my areas of growth or curiosity? Sure. Um, and then I, I also like to write about what I'm reading, and I do I do book reviews sometimes so and I find that people people like to hear about book reviews and they may or may not have anything to do with business or fashion um, but they have everything to do with empathizing with other people with with like you know I think that's part of how we practice empathy is simply by reading because yeah. we get we get to hear another point of view, we we experience it through a story, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, and it expands our ability to understand more people. And and I think that's how, at least for me, that's how it ties into what I do. That you know, the whole the whole point of 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 sustainable and ethical clothing is is to remember that that the status quo of fashion is harming a lot of people and we don't see it you know we're so removed from that and um and i think that we need to practice empathy even if it's in first in our own heads and reading before we can take action on it I, I love that and i think just that what that triggers for me is um, my firm belief that if we do things like read and learn about empathy and notice the world around us and do some research that we can't turn back that there's, yeah. a, there's a tipping yes. point where the information becomes so centralized for us and the message mm -hmm. is so clear that we have to move forward and and that's really my my mission right now is to get people to take personal responsibility for learning mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. for believing that they can make a difference in sustainability because mm -hmm. i believe that you know every time i make a small change every time i commit to buying from companies that are you know doing the right thing every time i do it i come closer to actually changing the world Mm -hmm. And I think that we can, we can protect the world. I think you believe the same thing that, that you mm -hmm. are hopeful. You wouldn't be doing yeah. this if you weren't. Right. Right. And so you believe that we can make the changes we need to change. And it's mm -hmm. all about awareness. Yeah. All about yeah. awareness and paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that and, is and, awesome. And it is, and, and it is hard to, to take the blinders off, but, 
And because it can be very overwhelming too. Like there's so much wrong with the world. How can what I do make any difference at all? But I think that the only way we can make a difference is to believe that everything matters, no matter how small. And if you can only do one small thing today, it's better than nothing. It's better than what you were doing before. And any time you do something that's better than, you are part of a cumulative effect that's in a, the cumulative effect of you and other people mm-hmm. or the cumulative effect of once you do that one thing, you realize you could do it again, or you could do, you could do this, you could take on this and then maybe take on a little bit more tomorrow or you could do a little bit more. And, and um, yeah, I think, you know, just, just like we got into a, the, the situation that we are now in the, in, in the world, you know, just looking at, you know, we could look at everything, but in, in terms of the world of fashion, how mm-hmm. wasteful and harmful it is, that happened gradually. Yeah. It happened one piece, one garment at a time. Um, so we can, we can only hope that we can undo it or, or steer it differently, yeah. one garment at a time. I also think what's wonderful about that is that, um, First of all, it does matter. So every time you take something out of your recycling and reuse it, that matters. But mm-hmm. on top of that, every time you do it, you want to do it again because it's about developing a pattern and it's about mm-hmm. feeling powerful. So if you pull it yeah. out, I don't know about you, but anytime I do something like that, like pull a glass jar out of recycling, and reuse it, I feel really good. Like I feel yeah. like, huh. I did that. Look at this. If I make my mm-hmm. own toothpaste, I say, wow, I made my, look at how cool I am. I made my own toothpaste. Yeah. yeah. And I think that what happens then is we start focusing on it more. And as we all know, the things we focus on take on increased importance to us. Mm-hmm. And then we want to preach about them. You know, we want to tell yeah. other people about them. So mm-hmm. if I'm making my own toothpaste, I'm much more likely to then mention making your own toothpaste to my friends. Mm-hmm. If I am, you know, searching for, um, environmentally friendly clothing, the more likely I am to reach out to the companies I already like and say, hey, I'm really only buying hemp and organic cotton right now. What are you doing mm-hmm. about that so that I can continue mm-hmm. shopping with you because mm-hmm. I care about you? Or I really am looking to only do upcycled. So what are you doing to start a program where you can help me upcycle mm-hmm. the clothing, but I can still be connected with you? Mm-hmm. And so I think it's such a beautiful cycle because once it, it's, once it starts, it's a snowball effect mm-hmm. that I did yeah. this and then I want to do this yes. and I want to do this. And I think that yeah. that is exactly what you're talking about, which mm-hmm. is, I think you're terrific. And I am certain people want to read your, bo- your blog and follow your, your fashion. Um, if you were talking to somebody who was kind of coming up and interested in, well, frankly, interested in um, your illustrative career or in the fashion career, what advice would you give to somebody who's just, you know, young and starting out and trying to find their mm. path? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's hard because there's, there's a lot Super of things. <laughs> um, I, I think I would, okay. I actually can think of two things I would say. One one is to just experiment. And uh, if, you, if you're curious about something, follow your curiosity and read about it, try doing it, talk to people who do it, and, and just follow that path, see where it goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, the second thing that I would say is almost, it's like, it's almost the opposite, but if you, you can balance both, is to sort of pick what or, or try to decide what is important to you mm-hmm. and that that is the overarching theme of what you do, you know, and, um, and to, to find the things that are themes, what are your values and how do you identify yourself? Mm-hmm. So, so for me, sometimes people say things like, how'd you go from medical illustration to fashion? It's so, it's such an opposite thing. Uh, But the unifying thing is I'm, I'm an artist. 
-hmm. at the, at my core, I, I am an artist. And so I don't view it as so wildly different, you know? Um, and, and then, and then sort of within the realm of, of this business, one of the things I quickly realized is that the more you learn about sustainability and ethical manufacturing is sometimes it's really complex yeah. and so, and sometimes it's really hard to know what's better. You know, it's probably even more, I mean, with ethics, it's a little bit easier because you can see how it's affecting people, right. but, but with sustainability, it's, sometimes it's really a toss up and it's hard to know what's better. You know, is it better to import fabric that's from halfway across the world or is it, or is it better to compromise that it's not organic, but get it locally, you know, like, yeah, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to know. And, and you have to kind of find your values and use that as your guiding principle. I think that, that it, I'm going to sum up what I think you said, and let me know if this is what you're saying, that, that your advice is find out what your values are, really define them and stick to them. And within that, explore lots of different options. So be open to mm -hmm. trying different things, but keeping those core values intact. Does that? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, what I love about that is that we hear that advice regularly or similar advice. Mm, um, mm -hmm. We had a 90 year old artist whose advice to artists was pursue art and within that, try everything. Because mm. you won't know what you love sometimes until you yeah. try it. Yeah. And so I think, again, that was sort of that core value of art creating mm -hmm. was a core value. But within that, there's so much within that core mm -hmm. value. Yeah. So that's wonderful. So would you say that that's sort of your driving passion as well? Because that was my next question is sort of what mm. drives you? Mm. Uh, I think what, yeah, yes, it would, it would be because um, my, my core value is, um, is to like, to have a positive impact on the world to, or to not at, at the very least, not be part of causing harm um and i uh, what what drives me is trying to make a difference and feeling like what i do has purpose you are very likable daphne oh thank you it's just such a pleasure to talk to you so is there anything we haven't talked about i want to ask you to tell us a story but First, I want to check and see if there's anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about today. Mm. Uh, not, and not that I can think of. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Usually by the time we're done with the conversations, people are like, well, we've covered a lot and there might be yeah. something, but off the top of my head, I can't right. think of what it is. <laughs> um, so then our last story, or the last thing I want to ask you to do is just tell us a story from your life. And I, I always explain that it doesn't have to be the story of your life. It doesn't have to have a big overriding, you know, message. It can, but it really is just something that feels like it's yours. And mm -hmm. so I would ask you to tell us a story that feels like it's your story. Sure. Yeah. Um, which is hard, actually. Yep. <laughs> it's hard to, it's also hard to think of a story that is, when you say just mine, it's a lot of our stories in our lives, like the story I told about my adopting my son, it's also a story about other people. Um, so well, what I mean, what I mean by my, but that it's yours is that you claim it. So not so much mm, that it's just about you. You can certainly have other yeah, people, but right, that it right. feels like it's yours. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to phrase it. But I do have a story in mind. It's, it's a short one. Um, so when I was like, probably around 12 or 13. Um, so I was, I'm Catholic. Uh, so it was at the time when, you know, my peers, the boys were starting to, uh, some of them were becoming altar boys. And, and I noticed that I wasn't invited to do it because I was not a boy. And it pissed me off. <laughs> so, so I, I told my, and I, and you know, no one, 
no one talks about it. No one says, oh, boys only. It just, you just, suddenly the boys are doing this thing that you're like, oh, huh. I didn't even know when, like, how did that happen? Or when did that happen? Because you're not in, because you're not invited, <laughs> you're not included. You don't even hear the conversation. So I also had no idea why, you know? So, so I made, I told my parents that the church was now accepting altar girls and that I wanted to be one. And I, and I told them that thinking that, that my father in particular would object to it. And therefore I would be able to argue and in arguing, I would find out why. And mm -hmm. I would also be able to exert my, um, my opinions and express my anger about it too, you know? And <laughs> to my surprise, my dad was so gung-ho about it. He was, <laughs> he, he was like, that is wonderful. It, that is such good news. Finally, the church is doing that. They should have been doing that years ago. And, and then, you know, they were like, okay, what do we do? You know, and a little bit of a back, backdrop. So my, my, my parents are also immigrants. So, well, I'm first and second. Oh, I don't know how to count the generation. My, my mother was born in the Dominican Republic. My, my father's parents were from Italy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there were things, I didn't realize this at the time, but there were things that now in retrospect, my sisters and I are like, yeah, we had to figure some things out on our own yeah. because our parents sort of didn't get the system sure. quite, you know? So, um, so they kept asking me, okay, what do we do? Every Sunday, they'd be like, okay, how do we sign you up? <laughs> and, and, and one day we were passing by the rectory after church and my dad was like, let's just stop in, let's find out. And I had to, I had to admit that it was a lie. <laughs> and that it wasn't true. <laughs> and, and he was so disappointed. Oh my goodness. And, yeah, and 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 it, I mean, it's it's like a funny story in our family. I get I I still get teased about that story sure. in my family about the, the big lie the Daphne told. <laughs> but it's an interesting big lie. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I, I for one thing, I learned about my dad. Yeah. Yeah, in a way that I was not expecting to. I mean, I found out something unexpected and in a way that I didn't expect to. Yeah. And um, which, and it was a pleasant surprise, you know? So that's also yeah. what made the story fun to tell is because, because he sort of came out a hero in it, yeah. you know? Well, and I, um, what I love about your choosing that story is that I think it, it, completely reinforces everything we've been talking about exploring and learning and asking questions. And sometimes we think we know the answer to, um, for example, sometimes we think that um, we understand that, you know, the polyester fibers in the ocean are the evil fibers. And now it's coming out that maybe the cotton fibers are just as bad in the ocean. Mm. And what we really need to be thinking about is cutting down our consumption significantly, regardless mm. of whether it's organic or polyester fibers. Mm. So, which doesn't mean the polyester fibers don't have a whole host of other issues. So mm -hmm. not actually, mm -hmm. not a message in support of polyester fibers, but mm. the message is the more we learn. And here was a situation where you learned something brand new about your father that was enlightening and probably yeah. shifted your relationship in a way that you yeah. never would have expected. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And, and also, um, you know, part, I think part of why I own that story is because, because I was a feminist before I even knew the word mm -hmm. feminist, you know, no one in my family was a feminist. No mm -hmm. one, like, I didn't, I don't even think I knew that word until college. Like that's how long it took. Yeah. But I, at my core was a feminist right from the start. Um, yeah. the, the other thing was, is I had to, um, 
had to figure out another way to find out why. You know, I had to keep yeah. asking why. And um, and I think that's something that I really own and that I know that sometimes people find it annoying about me that I'm the why girl. <laughs> I, <laughs> I ask why endlessly, <laughs> you know, and, Good. you Bravo. know, and thank you. And I, I think that, uh, in order to make change, we have to ask why. We have to not just accept things as, well, it's that way because it's always been that way. Yeah, I think that's, that is a beautiful sentiment to go out on. We have to ask why and we can't accept things just because they've always been that way. Mm -hmm. So Daphne, thank you so much. This was an excellent, um, an excellent conversation. You are um, inspiring and I, I think your fashion is really exciting. So we will make sure to share all of that. Um, we'll put a oh, link thank to you. Eco, um, Eco Petites when we post the podcast. Thank you. So people yeah. can reach you. And thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is fun. So Pleasure everybody, talk this has been Inclusiva Talks, Sustainability, and our guest, um, Daphne Orlando and Eco Petites. Thanks, Daphne. You're welcome. Mm -hmm.